Pastor, the only problem with being the jack of all trades is that I'm the master of none. So, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. But the other thing is, sorry, I don't have any handouts. I use a lot of scripture. Uh, so it was just harder to print it up. I know Pastor Cobb spoils you, but just follow along with me. What I'll do is we're going to cover a lot. I'll try to give you some of the longer verses you guys can look up. And then uh, anything else, I'll just read to you. And we're going to get through uh, this message here, hopefully, uh, within the next two hours. <laughs> I'm kidding, Brother Roy. <laughs> he looked at me. He gave me, he gave me that look. But uh, uh, the, the, in the five years or whatever I've been coming here, I've never asked Pastor to actually let me uh, preach on a Sunday morning. Anytime I preach on a Sunday morning, it's because he's asked me. So this is the first time I've ever asked him. And it's tomorrow is my wife's and I's seven-year anniversary. So for those of you that have been married longer, we're, we're almost catching up. But for me, uh, seven years was a big deal because when we first got married, um, I heard a pastor preach a message. And he, he didn't even know we were newlyweds. He just was preaching a message. And I remember him talking about this thing called the seven-year itch. Now, has anybody ever heard of the seven-year itch? It's a psychological term. People say that when you know, you're getting near the seven years, that's when most diver- divorces occur. It's also a famous movie by uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe back in like 1955. And I remember, I just thought to myself, you know, back then, I didn't like that message because he planted this seed of worry. You know, I was new to the faith, and I thought to myself, man, you know, how am I going to do it? What if I get to seven years, and, you know, I, I'm all of a sudden dissatisfied in my marriage, or something's going on, because, you know, it's seven years of living with someone 24-7 and sharing good and bad experiences. But then the more you read the Bible the more that I disagreed and disagreed with that type of statement. You know, if we're going to preach anything, we should preach against the lies of the devil. And, uh, you know, for me, the message title today is marriage is, is a biblical institution. Let's first, let's, uh, you know, let's establish that. So marriage is biblical, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, preach on the lie of the seven-year itch. See, because if God... We'll set something up from the beginning. Why would he destroy it if he's eternal? Then, you know, that's my very, first thing, my very first thought. So let's just go ahead and set this up. You know, marriage is biblical. And I'm going to give you... So the first couple of things I want you to know, this is not a message on adultery or on fornication or on divorce. But anytime you talk about marriage, we're going to touch these subjects. Unfortunately, for the sake of time, I can't go deep into all these subjects. But it's things that are necessary for understand what is biblical marriage versus what the world teaches because one of the things that the devil is going to try to do in the last days and he's doing now is the destruction of the biblical family you know the uh, marriage and the biblical foundation of uh, family and kids and being fruitful and the church and all that stuff so let's go ahead and just look there in first corinthians and then we're going to be in genesis so if you guys want to be in genesis while i read first corinthians just to set this up the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, it says, Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity en- envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether we, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And I want to start with this because obviously people know that 1 Corinthians, they call it the love chapter. But for us that read our King James Bible, it's the charity chapter. And there's a lot more to say to that. That's a whole other sermon. But the, the, what I wanted to focus on there was, look, it tells you all these things that it's not. But it tells you also the things that it doesn't take pleasure in. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, it says, Rejoiceth rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. So the very first thing is we have to establish the Bible's trying, I mean the world, not the Bible, is trying to redefine marriage. As a matter of fact, a couple years back in 2012 or 2013, the Supreme Court thought that they knew better than God and tried to redefine marriage to include the sin of sodomy. You know, and the Bible is very specific that it was from the beginning the way God established it. You know, and so we have to know what it is in order to be able to overcome these issues. Because, you know, the more you, I studied this seven-year itch over the years and even just recently just to, uh, you know, refresh everything that I was getting prepared for, they, they can't make up their minds. Now it's a, the four-year itch, the seven-year itch, 
the three-year itch, the nine-year In other words, of course, there's always going to be a time in your life when there's t turmoil and trouble, but if you're already planting the seed of people that when they get married, there's always the possibility of an out, then you're, you're basically setting them up for failure. And I think the thing that I want to leave today is that marriage is, is forever. And I mean, it's not, I know that in life, even here today, people have been divorced or remarried or, you know, that there's just been stuff and issues. And I think the reason that it's been like that is because it's hard to be founded on biblical truth. And so finding issues and finding excuses to do these things is easier than, than sticking to the truth. Now, that being said, we know God forgives and we know that we are all sinners, you know, uh, saved by grace and that he's righteous to forgive us our sins. That doesn't uh, stop me or, ha uh, or that doesn't give me an excuse not to preach against sin and against the fact that marriage has to remain to the end. You know, and the reason we do that is because it's established by God. So let's go to Genesis 1:26, and it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all, and over all the earth, and, uh, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female, created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then Genesis 2.18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me. And out of the ground of the, the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave the names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of the ribs of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And so right away, the, the couple of things that I want to establish is marriage is a biblical institution. You know, this is, the Bible's telling us here, you leave your mother and father and you cleave unto your wife and you shall be one. You know, we saw here that in a, we, that, that became her husband, right? The world doesn't define biblical marriage. The world doesn't define marriage, period. And the challenge is when you look at the Bible and how God established things, then you start to remove some of these false premises that the world's trying to sell you on why you should give up on certain things. And I mean, this message could apply to a number of things, right? I mean, the world's real quick to just let you know that if things don't go your way, you should just quit on anything, on any subject. As a matter of fact, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, individuals that got jobs back in the 50s and 60s, you know, they would retire with the same company through thick and thin after, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Now, the average uh, professional I mean, they jump around jobs in their entire career probably 7 to 15 times. You know, they're constantly in, in a state of motion. Why is that? Because they get that itch, and, you know, a psychologist coined it. They said, if you have an itch, what's well, natural for you to want to scratch it? Well, there's a difference between, you know, like right now I just scratched my nose. That's an itch, a physical itch that I scratch. But a spiritual itch should be discerned in the Word of God. So I'm just going to leave you guys with seven things. I mean, this is not an inclusive list. This is not, I mean, there's more to it, but this is just things that I've learned over the seven years that strengthened my resolve as the seventh year of our marriage came up. This is, the, this is a message that God laid in my heart seven years ago because it really hit me hard. And I thought, what, what injustice and what a failure. And I'm not saying that the pastor was a failure, just that message. And all men, I'm not uh, up here almighty and, and haughty because anybody can preach a message that, could be faulty for somebody else. So let me first clear that up. We're all sinners. We all have fault. But I just think it, you know, that it, it would have been something to be careful with instead of planting the seed, because it's a reality. People do get divorced about the seventh year. But instead of planting that seed, say, look, there's no reason to get divorced if you're following your biblical principles. 
So, you know, I'm just going to leave some biblical principles as to why marriage is important, not only when you go into it, but to the bitter end. I mean, to the end, actually, it's the bittersweet end, right? It's really sweet towards the end. And I'm going to tell you something. After seven years, I, I haven't gotten an itch. If anything, my resolve is I'm dug in deeper. You know, I tell Mary Sarah, if you leave me, I'm coming with you. So, you know, she's not, I mean, I, I am more in love now than I was seven years ago. And it was interesting, about three and a half years into it, that's about the time that, you know, I really was getting more into the word. That, that weird feeling of, you know, that dread of getting to seven years in our marriage went away. You know, unfortunately, at that time, I was really young in the word and really young in the spirit. And so things like that would move me much easier. And now, you know, as you get into the word, you can be uh, grounded and you can be anchored into the word of God. And it's not, I mean... You should take this, this message to just apply anything in your life. You know, there's times when we're just going to feel like we're flailing out there. And the Bible says that, you know, you're unstable enough in all your ways if you're a wavering man. If, if you're a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we should definitely just be grounded and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And then let me just, uh, before I give you the seven points here, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.10. It says, There, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the very first thing, and it's not even a point, but because it, this is, you can't have all these points if you don't have this foundation. Jesus Christ should be the reason that you're even seeking to marry somebody. You know, because I think one of the key causes of divorce it's not the top one, but definitely is when the spouse or the wife puts the other person on a pedestal and they worship that individual to the point where they, they, uh, they're overbearing on that individual. See, I love my wife, but I don't worship my wife. You know who I worship? The Lord Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is, you know, I, I wish I had time to tell you about how my wife and I ended up together and all the trials that we went through and, you know, her family at first didn't like me and I had to overcome a lot of obstacles. But one of the things that I do, that I am going to tell you is, I remember specifically, we were uh, at church in a singles out ministry, and by then I already knew that I would want to pursue this person for marriage, and I asked her, look, I, I'm a lot older now, you know, life's been really different and tough on me, and I, I got saved as an adult, and one of the things for me is that I need to know that if I were to pursue you for marriage, that you love Jesus more than me. I remember asking her that, and she said, of course. I said, well, good, because I love Jesus more than you. And, you know, if we don't, we can't have that foundation, we shouldn't even get married. And that's the way the, the marriages should be established. You know, Jesus is your foundation. There's no other name. We were just talking about that given under heaven by which anybody can be saved. There's nothing that can establish an eternal premise or a long-term premise than Jesus Christ. You know, if you have salvation by grace through Jesus Christ for all eternity, well, then you understand that you're in it for the long haul, Right? Marriage is not something that you just try, something that you're just going to try to figure out. But that's what the world would have you think. Just real quick, uh, before we get to the point, the seven-year itch, it's a psychological term that's used uh, to suggest that happiness in a relationship declines around year seven of marriage. Now, it's been around a while. A couple of things you're good, that, that, uh, that, that stand out to me is psychologists can't make up their mind whether it's a real thing or if it's fake. In other words, there's a group of psychologists that say, yeah, the seven-year itch, it's real. It happens. This is stuff that goes on. And then there's another group of psychologists that says, no, it's really all just in your head. I mean, it's just seven years is just the cycle of man. You know, every seven years they change. And so that just, that's the natural progression. That's a man. That's a worldly look at things. But the one thing that stood out uh, with me is that in 1955, that movie came out. I didn't know until I looked this up. It's called Seven Year Itch. And if you know the premise of the movie by Marilyn Monroe, it's a movie where a man sends his family off on vacation, and he's, he's right around the seven-year mark of marriage, and he starts to doubt if he's in it for the long haul. And what he does is then he takes on a flirty attitude towards Marilyn Monroe, and they flirt, and he basically he cheats on his wife and commits adultery. And, and the premise of the movie is, I guess, she rejects his advances, and now he's trying to hide it from his wife. I don't know. I've never seen the movie. So you guys can correct me on anything I got wrong, but that's the premise of the movie. Now, let me tell you a couple of things. Marilyn Monroe was a whore, and she was a fornicator, and she was into the occult, and she, was, uh, she had psychics, and uh, you know, she didn't believe 
like Christ believes. And people have been following this. She made this term popular. This term was not popular until 1955. This movie revolutionized the way people look at the seven year itch. Look up anything online, any study or research on the seven year itch, and they always they reference back to that, that movie in 1955. As so you think about how wily the devil is, he's been working at it for a long time. Well, what happened in the 60s? You know, you had the civil unrest revolution, the love revolution, the uh, no-fault divorce revolution. I mean, think about just how well it was planned to start to destroy the family unit. So these are just things that, uh, that stand out. But r right here, real quick, uh, you know, divorce rates in the U.S., they hover around you know, seven years. And then, uh, you know, a couple of things that really stand out is then you got the world and they, they try to tell you, you know, is the seven year itch fact or fiction? And there's a, there's psychologists. And this is how they base the way that we live our lives in our marriage. This guy named Rudolf Steiner created a theory of human development based on seven year cycles that were associated with astrology. What does the Bible tell us about astrology? It says it's wicked. And it's an abomination. So see, when the world gets advice, I mean, when Christians are getting advice from the world, well, of course you're going to end up thinking you need to divorce somebody at seven years or four years or uh, three years or 12 years. You know, I'm just turning the pages here. But, you know, these things are made up by the devil to destroy God's plan, God's eternal plan. And, you know, marriage is a picture of the church being wet to Jesus Christ, you know, and we're not going to go into all that because uh, there's a lot to cover. But let's go ahead and let's go into point number one. We're going to go through these really quick. I just wanted to make sure we set that up correctly. And the Bible, you know, the first thing we have to realize is that marriage has to be undefiled, right? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 4, it says marriage is honorable and all and the bed unde undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Well, the very first thing we realize is that God has set a plan where when we go into marriage, we should be going into it purified. Now, people say, well, you know, how do you do that when most of the world fornicates? See, the, the antithesis to being undefiled is that you fornicate. Fornication means that you have uh, premarital sex or relation, relations be before you get married. And it's kind of hard to do that when the CDC has a statistics out there that says that women between the ages of 15 and 44 that were ever married, whether they're divorced or married now, had premarital relations. In 2002, the statistics said that 84% of women fornicated before they got married. Then it says that 2006 to 2010, 86%. That means that, you know, if we're sitting in a room of 10 people, eight or nine of them fornicated before they got married. And so they're defiling the bed, or they're defiling what God has called pure, right? And the men, it's even worse. Men are in the 90s, 91%, 90%. So basically, almost every, every man, before they got married, went out and had premarital relations. But the Bible says, look, the reason that we don't do that is because it'll ruin you. Fornication is a sin of abomination, the Bible says. It's a wicked sin. And actually, God references not only to the physical sin, but he also references to the church. And, you know, and to Israel and to Jude in the Old Testament when it says that you went fornicating after other idols, and that's why I put you away. You know, let's go to 1 Corinthians 6.15. It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that that which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, say it, for two saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? For ye are bought with a the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the very first thing that we should promote for biblical marriage is you shouldn't fornicate. And we shouldn't tolerate fornication. You know, I mean, I, this is a topic that, that I'm fired up about because the world will attack you for your belief system, but they won't attack the world for being immoral, for being, uh, you know, wicked and defiled and filthy and just, uh, you know, 
gross. I mean, I don't know what other, I was trying to get all fancy, but it's just gross. You know, you think about, you know, fornication and just all it entails. It's just disgusting that somebody would do that. Now, the Bible says, I mean, I mean, the Bible, the statistics shows that a lot of people have done that. So there's a couple of things that I want to point out. Number one, look, if you're fornicating, stop it. If you fornicate it, ask God for forgiveness and stop it. And if you're thinking about it, just get married and just get it over with and just be with your wife. Look, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So the Bible's telling us that, look, if you can't live, like Paul, later on we read that, where Paul said, there's very few people that can do as I do. So if you can't resist that temptation, just get married. Don't fornicate, because it's a sin against the body, right? And then he says, look, the other thing is, once you're married, then remain married. In other words, do the things that married couples do. Don't just raise kids and go to work. Do all the activities they require because if you don't, Satan's going to tempt you and you're going to fall into adultery. So the very first thing is that we should look at the marriage, uh, we should look at marriage as something that should be undefiled. You know, and, 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 and in life, that's a difficult thing, right? Because we're all sinners and things are difficult. But that's not an excuse for not giving it a go. You know, the Bible is very clear that marriage is something that's holy and it's pure and it's for a reason. You know, have you ever met married couples that, uh, you know, they got married young and, and it was just them two and they were never with any other people? How many sexually transmitted diseases do they have? None. You know why? Because they're not fornicating and they're not doing things that are unseemly. It's really easy to maintain a pure, healthy lifestyle if you're just with one person the rest of your life. The second thing that, that I want to just point out about marriage is uh, that the world promotes cohabitation. And I really hate cohabitation, meaning you move in with somebody before marriage to give it a, give it a try, because what it does is it reduces your tolerance for commitment. And we'll talk about that here at the end, but really God wants us to just be committed. See, you're never going to know everything about anything. You either just got to do it or, or make the decision not to do it. You can't figure out the temperature of, of anything just by dipping your toe in it. Because, you know, have you ever done that? Have you ever, like, uh, you know, just, I remember when we were doing it for uh, our daughter, you know, you're filling up the bathtub and you test it with your finger and it feels hot. Then you go back and you test it. It's not that hot anymore because your body acu uh, uh, assimilated it. Then you put your baby in the water and they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's really hot. So what you got to do is you just got to go full in. Then you would know and realize what it, you know, the reality of what you're facing. But let's go there in uh, Matthew 19, and then we're going to be in Matthew 24. Matthew 19, and then we're going to be in Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 19, 8 says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. The reason I chose this is the very first thing is it goes back. Jesus is going back to saying, look, I created marriage. To be for, for life. You know, divorce was never part of the equation. Because they're talking about, you know, how to, when is it, is it all right to divorce someone or not. And then it says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth a, adultery. And whoso, marry, whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So the Bible is very clear that, number one, marriage is forever, or, you know, for life. But then if you get divorced and you remarry, now you're committing adultery, right? And if you're remarried today, you know what? Then just ask God for forgiveness and now stay with the wife that you're with. That's, the, that's your new will for your life. God's new will for you is that you be with your wife, the one that you're with now. You know, it's not like an article I read last night, you know, uh, is marriage antiquated. 
and uh, or it's married to an outdated tradition. And they said, you know, I'm not going to read it all for you because it's many pages. But the one thing that really stood out to me is that they're trying to get you to, to be just a cohabitator. It says, what's wrong with having five or six long adult relationships throughout your life? You know, relationships take you uh, to point A, to point B, and the next relationship takes you to point C and to point D, and the next one grows you from point D to point G, and the next one grows you from point H to M. In other words, the world's saying, look, it's okay, do whatever you want. And the Bible warns us of this. If you go to Matthew 24, verse 37, it says, But now as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of son, uh, the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, in, uh, in marriage into the day that Noah entered the ark. And I remember when I was younger and I would read those verses, it always was weird to me because obviously God wants you to be married. And I was like, why would that be a negative thing as to the days that are coming? But if you look at that, that, ver that phrasing right there, it says marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, what this article says right here, it's okay that you're, you're just changing your mind and you're giving into one marriage and you're giving into another marriage, and you're giving into, what is it giving into? It means that you're not grounded on what you believe in, right? And so somebody can come in and convince you to give into the new thought. You're giving into a new marriage or a new way of living or a new way of thinking. And so it's not enough that marrying itself is not the negative part. It's when you look at marriage, it's just something that is trivial as part of life. You know, as, as something that you do, it's just as common as dating someone or going to dinner. No, marriage is something that needs to be taken seriously because God says, look, as the man, it's your duty to provide for your family, to protect your family, to lead them. And as a wife, it's your duty to uh, order the home and raise the children and teach them spiritually and do these things. But if you're just, if it's just like, uh, like the world says it, I mean, my, uh, my sister uses this term a lot. I guess it's a term for uh, individuals between the ages of 25 and 30, they call it a, adulting. You know, that people say, oh, you know, they'll post stuff and they're like, oh, I'm cooking this meal. It's so fun to be adulting. I didn't realize that we had to tell people when we were adults because we forgot, you know, how to grow up. And so now when you do something grown up, you can tell everybody that you're adulting. See, pastor let me preach on Sunday morning, so I'm adulting. You know, thank you for letting me, I'm just kidding, pastor. But no, that's the way the world looks at it. Well, if you're playing house, if you're playing marriage, it's not serious. See, when, you're, when your daughter's two, three, four, five years old and she's playing house, well, she's playing house. But when you're married and you have children, you're no longer playing house. That is the house that you're running and you have a duty and a responsibility to Jesus Christ. So the first thing we looked at is we should go into marriage undefiled. Don't fornicate. Second is we should preach against cohabitation. Don't move in with somebody just because you think that, that uh, you know, you want to figure this thing out. As a matter of fact, statistics show that, you know, people who cohabitate are 33% uh, that's a 33% chance higher that they'll divorce because there's no commitment. And once that commitment is sets in, something triggers. You know, that's how you know it's a spiritual thing, right? When you get married, something triggers that all of a sudden, either the man or woman is like, whoa, this is, this is too much. Uh, there was an out before, but now there isn't. So, you know, we should, we should make a plea for marriage. Number three is rebellion versus obedience. You know, the Bible tells us in Genesis 3, verse 16, it says, and unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy, sor thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shall thou eat of, uh, of it all the days of thy life, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for, thus thou, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And I, I really think that this is a good indication. You know, obviously they're being punished for sinning at the Garden of, of uh, Eden. But one of the things that really stands out to me is this is where God sets up how to avoid the sins, you know, the temptations of marriage. You know, for the woman, it says, look, uh, uh, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. See, today in society, we have women who are trying to tell men how to run the house, 
in the home, right? And then it says to the man that he's going to have to work. It says, in sorrow shall thou eat all the days of thy life, thorns and thistles shall bring forth. See, if you're working, you don't have time to be tempted for adultery or for fornication or for the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. If you're busy doing the work of the Lord or actually just busy feeding your family, you know what you don't have time for? Stupid things, you know? But the challenge is that today, men are too easy to just let their wives go to work so they can stay home and do nothing. And you know, that's when the devil really gets you, right? When you're, what do they say? The, the uh, idle, idle time is the devil's workshop. And I, if I butcher that, I'm sorry. But, you know, when you're not doing something, that's when the devil gets you. That's when you're at your weakest, right? But if a woman is submissive to her husband and she follows his lead and he, though, leads, that's the, that, that's the key, right? If he leads to the home, then they're both going to be protected by the will of God. Let's look at uh, First Samuel. Well, let's uh, let's skip on here because I got a couple of things to look at. But uh, point number four, so three is, you know, rebellion versus obedience. And obviously, we have to be obedient to the word of God. There in the in those examples that I used in Genesis, God's setting up the punishment, but He's also setting up the rules, right? And if we obey those rules then we can avoid some of the further punishment. See, they already messed up. There's no coming back from eating the forbidden fruit, as they call it, or, or, or you know, listening to the devil. But God said, look, if you do these things, even though they're going to be difficult, you will avoid some of the pitfalls and the pain that comes in the future. The challenge is, you know, people don't want to work. You know, men want to play video games. Or, you know, maybe that's why we don't have that many numbers today. I don't know. Maybe the Texans are playing at 11 instead of 12. I, I didn't check the NFL schedule. But, you know, that's what happens, right? I've seen grown men. I know personally grown men who spend all Sunday following football. Not just like it was when we were growing up where you just watch football for the sake of the sport, but also because they're involved in a fantasy league. You know, I, that should give you an indication that, you know, you're running into some issues. The fantasy league where they're playing another game to see how they can win based on statistics and stuff. Instead of taking care of their families, instead of taking their children to church, instead of uh, you know caring for their wives, or just doing the things that are necessary to lead the home. So let's go uh, number four. Man, I got an itchy nose. See, I was talking about itch, and I just I can't stop uh, itching. But go to Matthew 15, and we're going to be there in Matthew 15. And the, the other thing we have to realize when you're going into marriage is don't go into marriage if you can't think for yourself. And what I mean by thinking for yourself is based on a biblical principle. You know, the, the world brainwashes you. Turn on Fox News Baptist. Turn on fake news CNN, whatever acronym you want to give it. Turn on, you know, just the, the television. And the first thing they're going to do is tell you what you should be scared about, what you should be feeling gooey about, what you should be prepared for. I was telling my wife, I can't believe that there's already Christmas decorations. What's the world telling us? That we should be ready for Christmas. Hey, look, October's not even over. Let me finish October and then I'll think about Christmas. Let me get through Thanksgiving and then we'll get to it. But go to Matthew 15, verse 16. It says, And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not, do not ye, ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth out into the belly and is cast out into into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. See, the Bible's telling us, don't be brainwashed by what the world tells you, because if you put in Worldly thoughts, guess what's going to come out of your mouth? Worldly thoughts. So if somebody says, at seven years, you should reconsider your marriage, and that's all you read, guess what's going to happen on the seventh year? You're going to reconsider your marriage. See, the reason I'm not reconsidering my marriage is not because, you know, it, we haven't had tough times, and my wife and I just, you know, we hold hands and, you know, frolic down the beach every day. No, we have tough times. I mean, there's been days where it's just been difficult to be married. You know, you're, you're dealing with another person of the opposite sex who doesn't think like you, who doesn't act like you, who doesn't dress like you. It's tough sometimes. But you know what's fun? When you come out of it and you learn from that experience, right? And the Bible says, look, this is how I set it up. Not 
what Fox News tells me or what Huffington Post tells me or what Sigmund Freud, that sick psychopath, tells me or what Marilyn Monroe tells me. You know, Marilyn Monroe couldn't keep a marriage to save her life. That's why she died young, probably had all kinds of issues. You know, she was 36 and I think she overdosed on something because her life was just pathetic. But why was it pathetic? Because she didn't have God in her life. But here's the challenge. You know, we can, we're, I'm not just picking on Marilyn Monroe. To this day, little girls and grown men worship at the feet of Marilyn Monroe. I know grown men who have cut out life-size figurines of Marilyn Monroe and mugs and shot glasses and stuff. And there's a whole website dedicated to all her sayings that little girls say, oh, this is great and this is wonderful. You know what they're doing? They're giving you a seven-year itch. You know, we shouldn't scratch anything spiritually until we've discer discerned and tried that spirit. Let's go for the sake of time. We only got a, a couple more points. Number five is we should have biblical influence instead of letting Hollywood influence us. And I already touched on that a little bit. But, you know, one of the things that, that really stands out is if you look there in Exodus, uh, go to Psalm 119, verse 65, but I'm going to read for you Exodus 24, verse 7. You know, this is... Uh, Moses, in Exodus, Moses is just giving him all kinds of instruction. He's having to do all... Man, Moses had a lot of work, you know, Pastor. So if I have to do everything, it wasn't anything quite like what Moses had to do. But in Exodus 24, 7, he says, And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. See, the challenge is we don't want to take this to heart. We want to read it. And if it sounds good, we'll do it. But if it sounds tough, I'm going to probably skip over that, right? And then we let people tell us that maybe the Bible wasn't written by God, but maybe it was written by man, right? Or that we let the people tell us not everything in the Bible, you know, applies to us to this day and age. Maybe it was written for a different area or a different age. But we'll sit there and we'll listen to idiots on TV tell us exactly how we should think. You know, we'll turn on the TV and watch romantic comedies and they tell you to follow your heart and do what feels best. But the Bible says, look, don't do any of that. And we're like, ah, I don't know if we're going to be obedient. What did the people say when Moses read it? He says, we will do and be obedient. Go to Psalm 119, verse 65. says, thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statues. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with, thy whole, with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statues. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. You know what the world does? They feed you all kinds of junk and crap for what? Thousands of gold and silver. See, we should have the pews filled to the brim today, and then our society would be in a different state. But too many people are busy watching whatever they have. I don't know what program he's on. I know football's, it's football season. But, you know, wives have to watch something when they're not watching football. So I don't know what's on for wives right now. But whatever it is, they should be here. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, 33, and then we got two more points. They're short, and we'll close out. It says, for God is not the author of confusion. See, a seven-year itch, a psychological term like that, causes confusion. Because it causes you to doubt, you know, did you really make the right choice? Look, love is a choice. It's not a feeling. You can fall in love with someone over time. And I honestly believe the older I've been, because I got married when I was 31, that you should just get married young and just figure it out and stay faithful to your wife. Because the older you get, the more temptations, the more set in your ways you get. And then it's easy to fall for these stupid traps you know, that, that I have here. But it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came, came the word of God out from you, or came it uh, unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the, that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet 
to pro prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. And then the verse I want to focus on there is, let all things be done decently and in order. See, the reason that we focus on a biblical marriage and the reason that we should preach hard for staying together with the wife of your youth or the husband of your youth is because God wants us to do things decently and in order. Have you ever met anybody going through a divorce? There's nothing decent and in an order about a divorce. People say, oh, we're going to get divorced amicably. And then you talk to them like a year later, man, that was the worst thing I ever went through. She left me penniless. Penny I'm going to make sure that if I ever run into her in the streets, I, you know, pe people get vicious. You know why? Because you weren't focused on the right thing. Because it's selfish. You know, the majority of people I know that are divorced, they got divorced because the wife stopped ironing their shirts. That's not a, a reason for divorce. I mean, work it out. Iron your own shirts until she figures it out. Lead your home. I don't know. Do something, but don't get divorced. You know, you, the only people you damage are your kids and that woman that you left. You know, women are more uh, susceptible and they're more emotional than men are. And then the only thing that you do is you make yourself harden. And you can, that's why most men, once they get divorced, have two or three or four marriages because it's harder to commit after you've done that once, right? It's harder to be faithful after you've been unfaithful, you know, after you've not done your duty to the Lord. So let's just go ahead and finish. Point number six, the Bible tells us to have joy. The world says that we should just be entertained. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but in the 60s and 70s, one of the things that marriages did is they said, okay, well, let's get married, but then let's be swingers. And I'm not gonna go into the details of swingers, but to this day, that exists. You know, it's just a form of entertainment. We'll be married, but we'll just date other people or be with other people, but we'll still be married. That's not what the Bible says. You know, and the reason they do that is because they can't find joy with the one person they've been with their entire life. They can't find joy in the Word of God. They can't find joy in the trials and the tribulations and the challenges that come from being married. Let's go to Hebrews 13.5. The Bible says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Isn't it funny that Hebrews 13, 4 said that the marriage bed is undefiled? And then verse 5, he says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So if God's not leaving us and forsaking us, why should we leave our spouses and forsake them? You know, if he set the president, if he's the leader, if he's the one leading with example, why are we going to think better than him? Why do we think we know better than him? That's really the term I should use. Go to 1 Peter 4, 1. And then we'll be in Psalm 36, and then we're going to be in Titus, and we're going to close out. It says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That's 1 Peter 4, 1. For he hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, in lust, excess of wine, reveling, or another word that we could use for reveling is entertainment, banquetings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. In other words, it's okay if we've lived that life, if we fix it, but it's not okay if we continue in that sin, right? He says, look, you walked in that. You did these things. I know because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nothing that you can do to attain. But he says, no longer, that's past tense, you no longer walk in that world, right? When I got married, I no longer look at other women, or I no longer desire to be with anybody else. That's my wife, says the husband of one wife. By the way, that means that, you know, the Mormon religion's got it wrong, multiple wives. And we know that's not even a good path, because look at what happened to Solomon. He ended up worshiping false gods because of women. They led him astray. Let's go to the last point, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll close out. The world is teaching you to be noncommittal, and God says you need to be committed. You know, there's nothing more committed than being saved by grace. You know, think about what God did for us on the cross. He paid it all for all eternity, right? He set the standard. Now, we can't pay for anybody's sins. We can't do that. But we can definitely do things for the long haul, right? Marriage is something that's not to be taken lightly because God never took the things that he did for us lightly. And the things that he continues to do, go to Psalm 36, and then we're going to be in Titus 1, and I'm closing out. It says, To the chief musician, 
a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. The transgressions of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. See, the world, eventually what happens is if you don't take this thing seriously, of marriage, of family, of church, of reading your Bible, I mean, just take anything that God says, then eventually you're going to say to yourself that there is no fear of God before his eyes. He says, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. See, what happens is you don't just end up being in the world. You end up hating God and then you end up speaking against him. It says, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth, I mean, he deviseth mischief upon his bed. I don't think it's a coincidence that that verse is there when you're starting to hate God then you're willing to do whatever. I mean, think about Moses. He went up to the mountain. And what did Aaron and they do? They didn't just worship the idol. They had an orgy. You know, they, they did all kinds of unseemly things. It says, He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. See, the Bible tells us to hate evil. They don't hate evil. It says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness, that's another word for commitment or duty, right? Reacheth unto the cloud unto the clouds. So God is faithful to us and we should be faithful because if we not if we're not if we promote the things of the world Eventually what happens is it's not just enough that you're in the world What ends up happening is the world will end up hating God That's the only path that you can lead when you're not preaching the Word of God is that eventually if you're not with him You are against him, you know, that's why this type of mentality and and believe me I've heard a lot of sermons from that pastor. He's a very good pastor, or, or was at one point, you know, when I heard him. But that one message, you know, whenever we plant a seed of doubt, you know, that's a bad path to start taking people on. And it's not a coincidence to me, I, I'm not, that's why I'm not even giving the name, that there's been a lot of divorce in that church. You know, if you start planting that mentality, then you're going to have that. You know, this church has a lot of couples that have been married for a long time. Well, there's not a better example than Pastor Cobb and his wife who have been married for many, many, many years. You know, that's something for me to look forward to. That's a great example that I can live up to. And let's just close out with Titus 1.15. It says, unto, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. See, people don't like when we preach this type of message because what ends up happening is the path against Christ leads to being cut off from Christ. It's not just cut off that you're damned to hell because we're all condemned to hell. It's that in this life, we can reach the point where we no longer have that opportunity. Look, if we're preaching against the things of Christ, then what we're doing is we're setting people up for failure. Why... Why am I tying this to salvation? Why am I tying this to, to, to being a reprobate? Why am I tying it to it? Because you're either married because you believe in the biblical principles of Christ or you're married because the world tells you that that's the cool thing to do. You know, I can think of people in my life that are going to be married in the next couple of months after they've lived together. You know, I always wonder, my, my wife and I think it's real funny, and I'll close out with that. It's, we think that it's real hilarious how people are like, Oh yeah, we're going to get married. And then they go through the whole process. And they upend your entire life. And they're like, please travel millions of miles to come to our wedding. And here's our registry and spend money on our gifts. And then they're like, well, okay, well, where are you guys going to Oh, we're already living together. We've been living together for two years. Why are you asking for stuff? I mean, what are you doing? It's not a marriage. You know, when my wife and I got married, it was fun, right? Because we would never lived together. So it was fun to open up all the gifts. We didn't have, uh, you know, kitchen supplies or, you know, bathroom stuff. And my wife did all the decorating. But she, that's exciting for her. We didn't have any of that. So it made sense that we would set up a marriage to celebrate our union, to let people know that we're committed for life. And then, hey, we appreciate the fact that you're giving us a head start. But if you're already doing it, then you're just, that's deceitful. That's a waste of time. That's disrespectful to the people that you're inviting to that wedding. You know, and God doesn't do that with your life. He doesn't play, uh, he doesn't play eternal life. He doesn't say, do these things and I'll give you this. He said, I paid it all. Believe on me and you shall have eternal life, right? 
Well, it's the same thing with marriage. Look, if you believe in that person that you're with, you're with them till death do you part. You know, marriage should not be a psychological event. Marriage should not be something that you're trying to figure out. You're either in or you're out. You know, the lie of the world is that you're going to get an itch at three years, four years, seven years, whatever they want to call it. But the Bible says that he established it from the beginning. In Genesis, the very first couple was male and female, and they were married. It wasn't Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve, and it was for life. You know, as a matter of fact, we know that because eventually, if you read later on, Adam and Eve just passed, but they had their children. And, you know, and I didn't even get to cover the whole thing, but let's go ahead and just close out in a word of prayer because I know I went over a little bit. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your wonderful uh, uh, word and just the, the institution of marriage and what it does for a man and a woman that are serving Christ, Lord. And we know that there are exceptions, but the, those exceptions prove the rule. And there are men and women who will never be married who will serve you uh, to the day that they die. But for us that uh, have those uh, feelings or temptations, Lord, just keep us uh, undefiled, keep us pure, keep us uh, thinking for ourselves through your word. Let not the world influence us with the stupidity and the ideas that they come up with. And Lord, help us to just fight against the devil and all his, uh, his wily ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.